here we consider things like this. For example, in yoga, we call your spine the center of the universe. We call it Merudhanda. That means it's the axis of the universe. What is a universe? Please understand this. Today scientists are admitting it is an endless universe. Forever they said, if you travel this many million light years, you will reach the end of the universe. But now they are admitting it's an endless universe. Forever we've been saying it's an ever-expanding universe. So we said, your spine is the axis of the universe. That sounds ridiculous. Even without putting any load, most people's backs are hurting badly. <laughs> they can't even <laughs> walk or run or do anything. If this becomes the axis of the universe, what will happen? Why we are saying this is, See, you know there is a universe or you think there is a universe only by your experience, isn't it so? If you did not experience, if you did not… if you could not see this, if you could not see like this and feel like this, you wouldn't know there is a universe. Only because of your experience there is a universe. And the center where your experience is being transmitted is through your spine. If we cut a few wires in your spine, you will have no experience even of the body, forget about the universe. So because your… your ability to experience the universe is rooted and centered in your spine, we are calling your… your spine as the axis of the universe. Suppose this hall, see now we know the boundaries of this hall. Now we can debate whether this is the center of this hall or that is the center of this hall. Suppose there are no boundaries to this hall, how would you decide which is the center of this hall? Where you are is the center of the hall, isn't it? From this basis, we developed a whole possibility for a human being, how not just to believe these things but to make it into a living experience. It is from this the word yoga came, that the inclusiveness happens not because I tell you, oh I love you, you love me and all this stuff. Inclusiveness happens simply because you obliterate the boundaries of your individuality. Not because I love you, you love me, I hug you, you hug me, so because we are inclusive, no. All that will last for some time, tomorrow if they do something that you don't like, it'll be finished. But you obliterate the boundaries of your individual nature, including your body, that you know how to sit here without being identified with the boundaries of who you are. Your physical structure, your mental structure, your emotional structure has a boundary. It may be large or small, no I'm not talking about the body being large, it may be large or small but it has a boundary. But there are dimensions which have no boundary. What doesn't have a boundary is non-physical in nature. So our focus has always been on that dimension which is non-physical. That is why Shiva became the most important thing because Shiva means that which is not, that which is non-physical. Now is he… The, the yogi that we are talking about, is he a, a human being, is he… did he come from somewhere else? There are many things uh, <laughs> this audience need to be primed for this because it's a long story you are asking. I'm trying to encapsulate it in two minutes, that's dangerous because it looks silly. Let me… there is a book, uh, Arundhati is here, uh, you know, we spoke together and she kind of uh, put it together. And there's a book on uh, Adiyogi, uh, which is going into these aspects, but let me put it across. See, there are things. As you said, there is no parentage. When you talk about Shiva, there is no parentage, there's no place of birth, there's nobody saw him as a young boy to grow up. All the time when we saw him, he was about the same age. And we don't know where he died, such a significant human being even in those times, if he died somewhere, there must have… they should have built a temple, they should have built a, some kind of a monument for him, nothing like that happened. So there is no birth, there is no death, there is no parentage, there is no siblings, there is no anything to prove that he was here. Does it mean to say we can assume he came from somewhere? Not necessarily, but in many of the… if you look at the lore, it's very common to refer to Shiva as Yaksha Swarupa. This means, Yakshas means always those… those kind of beings which are not human but who supposed to have existed in the natural env environment in this planet, in the forest and other things. Whatever we were referring to, some kind of beings or creatures or whatever you want to call them, 
who are not human in nature. So many, many times in the lore, you will see any number of songs and other things talking about Shiva as a Yaksha Swarupa. So there are many things which point, but there is no specific proof that he came from elsewhere. One thing is the level of intelligence in terms of his mathematics, his music and uh, his geometry, what he thought in terms of that. When you look at it, the times that we are referring to, see, uh, in the yogic culture, let me admit this in front of this uh, crowd because, oh my God, there are cameras. Uh, in the yogic lore, it is estimated Shiva or Adi Yogi existed as a person, he walked this land somewhere between sixty to seventy-five thousand years ago. When I sp first spoke this, all the more sensible people around me who are not as naive as me, they're wiser people, younger people, they said, Sadhguru, if you say seventy-five thousand, they will blast you. The only archaeological proof that is there that uh, Adi Yogi or Shiva existed is about twelve thousand six hundred years. You should say twelve thousand six hundred or thirteen thousand or fourteen thousand. I said, okay, fifteen thousand. <laughs> <laughs> but actually in the yogic lore, there is a clear aspect of they're talking about celestial arrangements. These celestial arrangements, if you go by the modern astronomy, they existed only somewhere between sixty to eighty thousand years in that span. There is no two ways about it, the things that he is talking about. And uh, now, off uh, the Cambay, what's, the, what's it called? In, uh, what is the Indian name for that, I'm sorry? Kumbhat, oh, is it? Yeah. Off the Gulf of Kumbhat, now they've done explorations. They actually went there to clean up the plastic. But then they found a city which is five square miles and now international archaeologists from… especially from Germany and France, they have dated this according to carbon dating uh, process that it is a minimum of thirty-two thousand years. Thirty-two thousand years ago, nowhere on this planet did a city exist. Not just a city did not exist, the idea of a city did not exist. But they had a city which is five square miles in size properly, orderly way of doing things. It's been buried, they're estimating it was… it has gone under water for about nine thousand years. And similarly, of course, everybody has heard about Dwaraka. There are… there are excavations which unfortunately now is the line of control between India and Pakistan, you can't touch it. If you dig, <laughs> something else will happen, you'll hit the mines <laughs> So, there is enough proof today, archaeological proof to say over thirty thousand years ago, there was a civilized society here. Maybe not across the country, but in pockets it existed. So this dating goes back like this. So I'm just saying over fifteen thousand years, so that when I travel west also I look sensible. Okay, fifteen thousand, all right. <laughs> Seventy-five thousand, they'll resist because their idea of the world is only three thousand years old. They said everything happened in six days and it's only three thousand years old. Anything beyond three, three thousand years is not scientific. This has been the approach unfortunately. Now slowly they're correcting themselves without looking stupid. But it's utterly stupid. For all these centuries you insisted it's only three thousand years. Now you're slowly extending it because science comes and says something else. You will watch it in the next fifty years. Science will ca come and say… modern science will come and say many things which we have been talking for thousands of years. So, Sadhguru, Einstein said that uh, time doesn't exist, but we seem 